Americans Research Seminar Series. My name is Michael Benjamin. I'm the Assistant Division Chief for the ARB Research Division. Today's seminar is on new diesel uh, technology engines, and we'll be discussing both exhaust emission controls and animal toxicology studies. Our presenters will be Dr. John Wall and Dr. Jacob McDonald. I'd like to, at this point, introduce our Executive Officer for the Air Resources Board, James Goldstein. Thanks, Michael. Good morning, everybody. It's really wonderful that you've all uh, come to uh, hear Dr. Wall and Dr. McDonald talk about their research. Um, today's research seminar will present uh, data from uh, ongoing Advanced Collaborative Emissions Studies, or ACES. ACES is a program, as I think many of you know, that's jointly sponsored by industry and government uh, to characterize the composition and toxicity of uh, new technology diesel emissions. Uh, today's speakers are Dr. John Wall, who's Vice President and Chief Technical Officer of Cummins Incorporated, and Dr. Jacob McDonald, who's the Director of Environmental Respiratory Health Program at the Lovelace Respiratory Research and uh, Center and Principal Investigator of the Animal Toxicology Components of ACEs. Today, uh, this morning, they're going to present an overview of uh, the uh, sort of evolution of U.S. engine, uh, diesel engine design over the past uh, 20 years or so, and also provide an update on animal toxicology results uh, from the ACEs study. So again, it's really wonderful to have such a good turnout. I kn we know that uh, people on the web are watching, and we're glad that you're here, too. I know there'll be an opportunity for questions after the presentations. And so again, a welcome to all of you. And uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Drs. Wall and McDonald. Thank you. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm Yeah, I'm good. All right, thanks. No. OK, thanks very much. I, uh, I'm John Wall. Jake will come along later. If you will indulge me in just a, a short walk down memory lane. The first time I made a presentation, a technical presentation of the Air Resources Board was uh, around about 1982. Um, at that time, I was a research engineer at Chevron. We were looking at the effects of diesel properties, diesel fuel properties on uh, exhaust emissions. Uh, Kat Hookman, who some of you may know at the uh, Desert Research Institute, and I were, uh, were working together at that time and got on to the effect of fuel sulfur, uh, the impact of fuel sulfur on particulate emissions. Uh, so I had a chance to make that presentation. Uh, I met a young engineer named Tom Coquette. Uh, about that time, uh, Jerry Brown was the governor and Mary Nichols was the chair of the Air Resources Board. Uh, so here I am 30 years later, uh, Jerry Brown's the governor. Uh, Mary Nichols is the, uh, is the chair of the Air Resources Board, and uh, I just bought a house in Moran County about a year ago, so I feel like things are, uh, are coming back together again. Um, at that time, I didn't realize that, and as time has passed, I, it has occurred to me that Tom and I might have been twins uh, separated at birth, but obviously my mom fed me more than, than his did after that, that time. So I'm very happy to be back and, and to really share you what, with you what Tom and I and thousands of our friends have been up to uh, in the last 30 years uh, as we have evolved diesel technology and the regulations uh, with them. So I'll talk about the, uh, the emissions technology, uh, the, the development of the new technology diesels, and then Jake will talk, uh, give you an update on our advanced collaborative emissions study where we are looking at the first uh, animal study that has been done with these new technology engines. I think it's really important that we also recognize and celebrate the partnership that we've had together over time, that certainly regulations have the job of driving technology, but technology enables the regulations. Uh, and so it's been a very healthy uh, and strong collaboration it is not without its contentious moments from time to time, but is in any case where you're really trying to strike um, the right balance among a number of uh, a number of things. If you're not feeling attention, you're not in the right place. Uh, and so we've been able to work very effectively together, I think, at, at striking this balance, uh, bringing along the technology, bringing along the regulations, and developing the, the new technology engines. Uh, first, a word from our sponsors. You know, it's, uh, it's very interesting for us to talk about emissions technology, and that's what I'll do for some time. Uh, 
uh, as we're looking at uh, developing these engines. But we have to remember that the whole point of developing engines is for them to do work for our customers. And the way we get low emission technology into the marketplace is people buy it. So why we get very wrapped up in low emissions, uh, we also have to keep in mind all the things that customers care about uh, when they're buying these products. And for these commercial vehicles, of course, these are business decisions that people are making. So it's got to be a good capital investment to replace the old technology, uh, and that's what we strive to do. So as we have been working on technologies to deliver low emissions, we've also been looking at how can we increase the power uh, how can we increase the fuel efficiency, improve the maintenance intervals, uh, make the engines more reliable and durable, and, and we've been able to do that over time. Certainly uh, since, since the mid-80s until today, um, we've seen pretty much a steady progress in engine efficiency. Uh, certainly with the recent engines, the engines that you'll see outside today, if you take time to take a look at them, the SCR engines are the most efficient engines that we've ever produced, and they're at more than 90% lower uh, NOx levels than when we started out at the very beginning. Uh, there are million mile engines where there were 250,000 mile engines at that time. Uh, the power density is almost double uh, what they were when we started all this out. So, so a lot of the technologies that we've been developing not only are good for emissions, they're very good for our customers. And that's one of the things that we consider as we're looking at how do we advance these regulations and how do we drive the technologies in the marketplace. So I'm going to really talk about two categories of diesel engines to make things easy. One, the, the traditional diesel engines, or the old stuff that, uh, that we were manufacturing when we started down this path, and then the new technology diesels, and I'll get clearer about the distinction for the new technology diesels as we go forward. I did think, just for a historical perspective, I pulled up this quote, so much has been written and said about the diesel engine in recent months that it's hardly possible to say anything new. And uh, that was uh, said by Rudolf Diesel about 1910. So I, we've, had, we've actually had a few more things to talk about since then. Uh, and I think you're all familiar at this point with the evolution of uh, the U.S. heavy-duty diesel standards uh, over time from, you know, starting in the 19, uh, late 80s, really, and then moving on through. This just steps down from 1994 to the current uh, as we've been uh, moving ahead not only with particulate and NOx emissions, but also with fuel sulfur. It turned out that as we got into the fuel sulfur and understood it better, in order to be able to meet the emissions regulations for particulates, it was necessary to drive the, the fuel sulfur levels down at the 3,500 ppm sulfur content levels that were typical uh, back in the late 80s. Uh, the sulfate alone was more than the particulate standards uh, that we needed to meet. And so driving the sulfur down really initially focused on uh, on particulate emissions. Later, uh, as an enabling technology, for uh, oxidation catalysts, for NOx adsorbers, and for other technologies that we've been able to bring on uh, at the same time. And that's true both on highway and off highway. The nice thing about fuel sulfur is also it is a retrofit technology that hits the whole fleet at the same time. Uh, so you're not having to wait for new engine technology to make its way into use. Uh, when the fuel sulfur regulations change, all the vehicles benefited from that. Uh, and the atmosphere, about uh, the atmospheric particulate from fuel sulfur is uh, on the order of 15 times the particulates directly emitted by the time the SO2 gets converted to particulate in the atmosphere. So that's been a huge benefit uh, in addition to the engine technologies that we've developed. Uh, we've worked on all systems. Now, these are really the critical subsystems that, uh, that go into making a diesel engine, fuel systems, uh, turbochargers, uh, air control systems, the electronic controls, the combustion research, the exhaust after treatment systems that have come into play in recent years. And all those, where you can't say the phrase uh, system integration too often when you're talking about what we do and as, as we've developed these technologies. And so all of these have evolved uh, over time uh, hand in hand with the regulations. And so this is just one way to look at it. Back, back when we started in the early 19, uh, really early mid 80s, there were a lot of different engine designs uh, in the marketplace. Two stroke and four stroke, uh, two valve and four valve, direct injection, indirect injection, 
uh, pump line nozzle, unit injectors, a wide variety of technologies that had grown up in different places uh, over time. As the regulations really began to converge, uh, transient emissions controls came into place. Uh, and by the early 1990s, the engine architecture had also converged on four-stroke engines, four valves, uh, centralized injectors, generally unit injectors, uh, uh, turbocharged and aftercooled in order to be able to control NOx uh, with, the, with the aftercooling while we were controlling the particulates. Uh, as we moved on, by 1994, uh, everyone was using electronic uh, control of the fuel injection. We needed that additional control in order to be able to, to work the NOx and particulate trade-off. Many of you may know that uh, that typically those two trade off if you're just looking at very simple timing swings with the engine. If you do things to control the NOx, which is typically reducing the temperature during the combustion process, uh, that tends to make the particulates go up because uh, you're not burning up all the particulates that's made during combustion. So that's one of the balances that we struck. And with, uh, with electronic fuel systems, uh, that allowed us to be more subtle uh, in the control of the engine and how we schedule the injection timing uh, over, the, uh, over the engine cycle in order to be able to get the NOx and particulate to the levels that we needed. Then the 2002 time frame, uh, exhaust gas recirculation began to move in uh, to application. NOx control in an engine is all about temperature control during combustion. Uh, and so you saw stages as we were evolving up to this point of lower and lower uh, temperature uh, as the turbochargers were applied, the turbocharger compresses the air and makes it hot, so we went to after coolers to cool it back down again uh, so that you've got cooler engine air going in uh, to cool down the peak uh, temperatures. And systems got more and more aggressive about uh, how they were controlling the air temperature, how much compression was going on outside the engine versus inside, and it was all about controlling the, the peak temperatures. By the time we got to the 2.5 gram NOx standard, uh, you couldn't cool the air enough in order to be, and certainly looking ahead to 1.2 and, and beyond, you couldn't cool the air enough to really get the right balance. Um, and so exhaust gas recirculation was used to take some of the exhaust and cooling it, put that back into the engine, uh, and it sort of acts like dead weight during the combustion process. As the combustion is uh, taking place, it's got to reheat the, uh, the exhaust uh, that you've put in there. Uh, that takes some of the energy, it keeps the peak temperatures down and control the NOx emissions. It also makes it hard for fuel to find the oxygen it needs to burn. And so injection pressures went up at the same time. So with, with EGR uh, came along, higher injection pressures uh, uh, in order to be able to control the particulates. In 2007, now, the particulate levels were so, now backing up again, you know, not quite as long a walk down memory lane, but when I first went to Cummins in 1986, we were working on particulate filters then, because we thought we might need them to hit 0.25 grams uh, particulate, and we were sure we were going to need them to get to 0.1 gram per brake horsepower hour. Uh, and of course, with the evolution of the combustion technology and the better mixing, uh, and atomization we were able to get with higher injection pressures, we were actually able to meet the 0.1 standard uh, without particulate filters. There were some oxidation catalysts that came in on, on some engines at that time, uh, but by the time we got to 0.01 particulate, uh, we needed particulate filters. Uh, and so that was a big step going to diesel particulate filters, and with that, typically oxidation catalyst, either on the particulate filter itself uh, separately or, or sometimes both. So it's that combination that came into play in 2007. And then in 2010, uh, selective catalytic reduction for NOx control to get down to the 0.2 grams NOx and be able to maintain the fuel economy and power density of the engine at the same time. Now, the transitions aren't quite this uniform and clean. Uh, at each one of these transitions, there's some time where there's a mix of the older technology and the newer technology in the marketplace, and everybody has their own way of, of optimizing their business model internally and, and externally. But generally speaking, after a while, uh, these things shake out. And in the end, of course, it's not us that decide. It's the customers that decide uh, which one of these technologies that are, are doing the job for them. Um, so that's where we are today. After this, uh, the rest of the story, I think a lot of the rest of the story is going to be focusing on greenhouse gases, CO2, and fuel efficiency. I'll, you know, I'll come back in 20 years and Tom, we can talk about uh, CO2 emissions and how that played out. Uh, but the real revolutionary step along the way that distinguishes the traditional diesel technology from the new technology diesel is the one that happened in 2007. 
uh, and that's the combination of ultra low sulfur fuel and diesel particulate uh, filters with oxidation catalysts. Um, and that, you know, that really, I'll, I'll spend some time on that distinction. There were evolutionary steps, of course, along the way. And that's not to say people weren't working hard to take every one of these steps. Uh, but that was really the big thing. And the big watershed event that, that really changed the character, the chemistry, the mass of the particulate in the exhaust, and really changed, I think, the perspective on the health effects of the, uh, of the whole diesel exhaust at the same time. Uh, so let's talk a bit about some of these technologies. With the active particulate filter, typically uh, it's an extruded ceramic, uh, most often cordurite, um, that you can imagine you sort of squirt it through. A mo I'm sure the people that do this for a living wouldn't appreciate the simple characterization, but you're squirting this out through a mo mold, um, and you've, you wind up with a piece of ceramic that has the parallel uh, channels in it that you can see here. A little more detail. With, for the parallel channels that are in the ceramic, uh, they're plugged at alternate ends. So you can see there's a plug on the front end with the uh, exhaust flowing from left to right uh, of the upper and lower channels, and then the center channel has the plug on the right end. And the effect of this is that the gas flows into a channel and can only get out by flowing through the walls. And so that's why this is called a wall flow filter, a wall flow monolith. Uh, as that construction. So as the, as the exhaust gas flows through the picture, the, the filter, the particulate is captured on the surface. Um, and with the oxidation catalyst, a number of other reactions, oxidation reactions are going on at the same time. Now, filtering the exhaust is not the hard part. It's getting rid of the, uh, the carbon once you've collected it. Uh, that's the hard part, so the filter doesn't plug up. Uh, and so that's why these are called active uh, systems, because periodically they need to be regenerated. For many applications, the exhaust gets hot enough, often enough, to kick off the oxidation re reactions and incinerate the particulate on the filter. NOx is actually a very good uh, uh, oxidant. So if you see these particulate filters with SCR systems, most often you'll see the particulate filter upstream of the SCR because you want the NOx to help regenerate the particulate filter, and then you want to clean up the NOx when you're downstream uh, with the SCR systems. But in any case, you have to provide for the fact that we have to elevate the temperature. And this is also why retrofit technology of particulate filters is difficult, because you don't have all the controls built into the old engines. So it's not enough to just slap a filter in the exhaust. You actually have to be able to manage the regeneration event, either through the duty cycle of the vehicle or by some add-on devices that will add heat uh, in order to be able to regenerate the particulate filter. But these are extremely effective. The particulate standard changed from 0.01, or from 0.10 to 0.01 in 2007. Numbers that we see coming out of these particulate filters are numbers like 0 0.001, 0 0.002. So it is 10 times lower even yet than the standard because basically that's what you get. Uh, these are extremely effective filters. Um, so as you see the, the exhaust moving through, uh, the reductions that we're seeing are more than 99% reductions in particulate. Uh, hydrocarbon and CO are oxidized uh, because of the oxidation catalysts that are present. Uh, CO is virtually uh, eliminated. In fact, if you look at the data from engines with the oxidation catalyst or uh, oxidized particulate filter, they're down in the noise. Uh, of our ability to, uh, to resolve in the, in the laboratory. And then the polynuclear aromatic hydrocarbons and other compounds that have been uh, associated with toxicity are also reduced significantly, and I'll talk a bit about all of those. So that's the big deal. We, uh, as we made this transition, we were working on the combustion, the air handling, the fuel system and controls, but it was really the addition of the exhaust after treatment and the ultra-low sulfur fuel that really gave identity to the new technology diesel engines. Uh, so here's where we're going to go with, uh, with some of the slides coming up. We've got, uh, we, we'll look at the particulate levels. I've also mentioned that they are uh, one hundredth or a one thousandth, uh, the level of the new technology exhaust. Uh, they are very comparable in mass emissions in both particulate and NOx to natural gas and gasoline engines. And I'll show you some data on that. For, for a long time, natural gas engines have really been held out as the clean engine, uh, the clean fuel. It is. Those are very clean engines. Uh, 
Uh, and then when we first started working with them, they were cleaner than the diesel engines. But with, under the new regulations and with the new technologies, they're very comparable. And I'll show you some of that data. And also, there's quite a difference in the chemical composition of the particulate with the new technology engines compared to the, uh, to the old. So here's some data that was uh, actually some bus data that was taken from a CARB study. Uh, just showing on the left, and this is just scale to, uh, to 100 uh, just for on relative terms so you can see the percent difference uh, from the baseline engine that was without uh, particulate filter and after treatment to a series of engines that, uh, that had particulate filters, in some cases selective catalytic reduction, and you can see that uh, see the sorts of reductions that we saw uh, with the addition of those particulate filters uh, right down the line on the order of 99% uh, of reduction on average. Um, here's some data from some Cummins certification data. So there are a couple of, couple of dimensions to this data. Uh, if you look at the two bars on the right, uh, those are a 1990 diesel engine compared to a 2012 diesel engine. You're looking at NOx in blue and particulate in red. Uh, and you can see the difference. Uh, the particulates are graphed as 10 times the uh, particulate level, just so you can see the bars on this chart. So the numbers that are sitting on top of the bars are correct. The bar itself, if you read to the scale to the left, for particulate is 10 times uh, the level of particulate. Again, just so you got a chance to see just a little bit of a bump uh, on, the, on the 2012 diesel engine. The bars on the left, are natural gas engines. All these are from roughly the same engine platform. We made a transition from 8.3 to 8.9 liter engine uh, at Cummins over this period of time. So the older uh, uh, CNG engine on the left is the 8.3 liter engine, the 1990, same thing from the diesel, and their nine liter engines on the right. But the rest of the engine platform, it's the same engine platform that was uh, modified slightly. Uh, and you can see on the left, uh, the CNG compared to the, uh, uh, the old and the new CNG and the, and the old and the new diesel. So, the, so there are a couple of things here. One is we've actually made some pretty good progress with CNG over this time uh, in order to be able to, uh, to meet the emission standards. And the two is that, you know, as you look at, uh, at the 2012 CNG engine, the 2012 uh, diesel engine, when we say that they are comparable, they really are comparable, and, and you can compare that to, uh, to what was going on back in the 1990s. These, uh, I'll also call your attention to the footnote uh, underneath the title where it says negative test results are set to zero. What that means is that we are at the limits of detectability for particulate uh, and in some cases also for CO. So we will run a test, we'll measure the filter before and after and there's so, so little material on the filter that the noise in the measurement will give us a negative number from time to time. Uh, which we set to zero. So it really means we are at the limits of detectability. In fact, a lot of the investment we've made over this time, in addition to investing in the products, we've made a big investment in measurement technology just to be able to develop engines and measure them at these emissions levels. And either with, even with that, uh, the particulate is, uh, is at or below the detectability levels. Uh, on this, this is the same chart. The bars have moved over a little bit on the left for diesel and uh, natural gas and just adds a couple of heavy-duty gasoline engines. This is just data off the EPA website. So you can go there and look at the CERT data uh, for various engines. And we picked up the Ford and General Motors heavy-duty certified gasoline engines for 2012. And you can see that as you're reading across the natural gas, the diesel, and the two gasolines, they are, they are very comparable. Uh, if you look at particulate number, uh, which is another thing that we care about, it's, it will be a regulation in Europe. It's something that is being considered in the United States and is certainly something that we think about when we're considering health effects of diesel exhaust or anything else that's uh, particulate suspended in the atmosphere. Uh, and you can see the substantial reduction uh, by order of magnitude without reduction, uh, without regeneration, a couple of orders of magnitude uh, from the traditional diesel exhaust to the new uh, diesel exhaust, and this is data that came from the ACES program uh, engines that uh, Jake will be talking about a bit later. With regeneration, regeneration is that act of burning off the particulate in the particulate filter, so that's a distinct event. We want to be sure we understand what's happening during regeneration. This is largely sulfate emissions uh, because at the higher temperatures you can kick uh, the SO2 up to SO3 and, and generate considerably uh, higher levels of sulfate. 
Uh, and then this chart shows the breakdown of how the chemical composition has changed uh, over the period of time uh, from the traditional engines to the new technology engines. Uh, the left, left hand chart is uh, from some work that Dave Kittleson did back in uh, 1998 time frame and the right hand chart is data again from the, uh, the ACES engine. I would sort of call your attention to the bars in the middle before you start looking at the bar charts because uh, even though we made the pie charts the same size uh, the particulate level in the new technology engine is 98% uh, or a little more than 98% lower uh, than the uh, heavy duty engine that Dave was taking a look at. There are big, there's some big changes here that are uh, worth noting. The red pie chart, uh, even though it's maybe difficult to read, uh, the leftmost uh, on the left chart is elemental carbon. And you can see the significant reduction in elemental carbon from um, from Dave's work or from the, from the traditional diesel engine to the new technology diesel engine. Uh, you'll also see that the percentage uh, of sulfate has increased substantially. Again, these are extremely low levels of particulate with the new technology engine. So the absolute level of sulfate is considerably lower, but the contribution, the percentage contribution to particulate is much higher uh, in these. Uh, and then finally, the organic carbon content uh, is lower if you look at organic plus unburned fuel uh, on the left-hand chart than in the, in the right-hand chart. So again, these are, these are indications, we'll see more data shortly, but indications that not only reduce the particulate mass, but we've also begun to change the, the nature of that. And, and some of the other work that Dave has done clearly shows that with high and low sulfur fuel, you can turn the sulfates on and off. Much of the particulate that you find downstream of the, of the filter really is uh, sulfate. Jerry Liu in our lab has done some similar uh, compositional studies. And again, uh, to make it easy to see, uh, we've made bars the same and scaled them to, uh, to 100, but there's a 99% mass reduction uh, going from left to right. This is some work that he did that Dave Kittleson was also involved in uh, back in 2009, uh, looking at a 2007 engine with and without a particulate filter, measuring upstream of the particulate filter and downstream of the particulate filter. Uh, so the bar on the left is what was going into the particulate filter, and you can see that the lower light blue uh, bar is the elemental carbon. Uh, the hydrocarbons are in purple, and the sulfate up there at the top uh, is in yellow, or whatever color that turns out to be. Um, and then after the trap, you can see that it's mostly sulfate with small amounts of elemental carbon and, and hydrocarbons, in fact, less than you would anticipate uh, from the previous chart. Um, so this is, again, another indication of the substantial shift in the chemical composition of the particulate, not just a reduction in the mass. Tom Hesterberg looked at, uh, at other compounds in more detail. Uh, some aldehyde emissions, uh, for those of you who aren't really close to this, that characteristic old diesel smell that you get from the traditional diesel engines without oxidation catalyst and particulate filters, those are the aldehydes. Uh, that you can smell in the exhaust. And so you can see the substantial reduction in aldehydes. Again, the traditional diesel in blue on the left, the, uh, the new technology diesel on the right. If you look at polynuclear aromatic hydrocarbons, again, most often associated with health effects, you see, again, a substantial reduction from, uh, from 80 to to 99% uh, reduction in, in these compounds. Again, the numbers will vary around here. You'll see on this and on some other charts the magnitude of the numbers, but we are, we're sort of at the levels of detectability uh, for a number of these, uh, these compounds, and so the, you'll see some variation in the measurement. Um, only under duress will I read this entire chart to you. Uh, but uh, I, the, only, the point of this is that these aren't just a few casual observations. Uh, there's a comprehensive body of, uh, of information and data in the literature now that, that really documents the change in the chemical characterization of the exhaust uh, with the new technology engines, with the uh, ultra-low sulfur fuel, the wall flow, and the, and the catalyst. This, uh, this is from a paper done by Jerry Liu. I think, uh, all modesty aside, the facility that Cummins has at our Stoughton, Wisconsin uh, research facility that Jerry Liu operates uh, is one of the finest, if not the finest in the world for doing chemical characterization of the exhaust. Uh, Jerry has made a career of this. Uh, we've made a substantial investment in it because it's important to us to know 
uh, as we are doing things to manipulate the exhaust chemistry that we're moving everything in the right direction. Uh, and so we've used this facility over time to look at the effects on emissions of NOx adsorbers as we started to do very different NOx chemistry in the exhaust because nitroaromatic hydrocarbons are things that have been identified in the past as being, uh, being of concern and, and uh, some of them are mutagenic. And so we want to be able to track that to be sure we're not cooking up things that, uh, that we would prefer not to be. And so Jerry's, uh, Jerry's research documents that we have been uh, reducing these compounds across the board. He did some work recently uh, in collaboration with EPA and we discussed with uh, Air Resources Board technical staff looking at dioxins and furans in exhaust with copper zeolite catalysts in the SCR system because there's some there was some concern about whether with copper in the exhaust and heavier hydrocarbons would it be possible for us to be able to make dioxins and that's that's stuff that we're interested in too and so we've invested in this facility uh, Jerry has been operating and published widely. Those of you who are active in the field, I'm sure do know Jerry and are familiar with his work. Uh, and he's documented the, uh, the results of using these particulate filters and pretty much across the board, we're seeing numbers like these. Uh, so uh, if you just scan down the list, the single ring aromatics, the higher polynuclear aromatic uh, hydrocarbons, alkanes, uh, and the other mix, uh, nitro uh, polynuclear aromatic hydrocarbons, which are important, uh, elemental carbon and organic carbon, all of those have been reduced uh, substantially, and again, significantly affecting the chemical nature of the exhaust. So in conclusion, the new technology engines, specifically those that are operating on ultra-low sulfur fuel and operating on, uh, with oxidation catalysts and wall flow particulate filters have fundamentally different and significantly better, uh, if you're going to be different, it's better to be better, uh, significantly better exhaust characteristics in traditional engines, more than 99% reduction in particulate mass, chemical, chemically different uh, particulate composition. The next statement may seem a little bit gratuitous and it is not intended to be. It, I'm very serious about this, that the best emissions policy and technology come to effective and deep collaboration uh, between the government regulatory agencies and industry. And that is something that I think we have enjoyed. I've certainly enjoyed over time feeling like uh, that we were partners in developing these uh, regulations and technology and not, uh, not adversaries during the course of the event. And of course, to be sure that we meet the needs of our customers because once again the only way you get low emission technology in the marketplace is people buy it. Uh, and so that's what we're here to recognize today and to, to be able to celebrate. Uh, and I, I certainly appreciate your attention. We will, uh, I think, we can take some questions on this part because we're going to shift gears uh, in a significant way when Jay gets up here and talks about some of the, the animal studies. So if there are any questions about the engine technology, sort of keeping in mind that uh, We've got another part of the presentation to get through. Uh, I think we could take time to take some of those now. And let's get the mic around because we've got people online as well. So we may be getting some questions online. Yes. Yeah, this is Bill Dean with Cali PA. And you showed how the, the mass uh, is decreased and the number of particles is decreased. Do you know anything about the total surface area of the particles that get out? Um, I don't, Bill. I, uh, the, one of the things that we're struggling with a little bit is, you know, we've all had this traditional view of diesel particulate, you know, the old John Johnson scanning electron microscope that shows the carbon core and then the stuff all around it. It doesn't look like that anymore. And so Dan Greenbaum has been after me for six months to draw the new picture of diesel particulate. What's coming out is mostly sulfate. So to the extent that it's really, really tiny, the surface area would be high, but where it, since it's sulfate, it's not that, it's not that big a deal. If anybody's got a good idea of a sketch for the new particular, though, Dan would be glad to hear from you. Yes, hi. Thank you for a nice presentation, Johan Herner with the uh, ARB. I was wondering. Oh, if that you, was your data. <laughs> yes. Well, all of our all of our data here, really. Yeah, I've got some uh, questions about that when we're done. By the way, right. <laughs> I'll be around. I was wondering if you could talk about failure rates and main, uh, and deterioration rates of these after treatment devices, and also what you're doing to make SCR work at low temperatures. Okay. Sure. So two things, on the, the failure rates, the reliability of these has been pretty good. You know, anytime you put a new part out in production, we like for it to be perfect, and we do our best for it to be, and some of them break from time to time. But we have not seen anything, uh, you know, 
particularly significant. One of our motivations these days, of course, and one of the things that saves us from having broken parts running around the road is OBD is a lot more comprehensive. I didn't get into that today, but as you well know, that's been a big theme of, uh, of the development work uh, that we've done. So as we've stepped along, you know, as we went to EGR valves and EGR coolers, uh, you know, we had some teething issues with those. Uh, particulate filters, really not so much. There have been some uh, if you don't control the regeneration well, and so if there's some parts of the controls that allow too much soot to build up before you get into regeneration, then you can melt the filter. And so we see some of those in some applications and have fine-tuned the controls around that. But generally speaking, I think we're, we're feeling that we've had pretty good success. I know the warranty rates, if you, you, know, you, can, you can look at the cost of coverage for Cummins engines if you look at the annual report, you can see those have been uh, coming down pretty significantly. Uh, even over the last couple of years. So I think we're, we're okay on that front. With selective catalytic reduction, you know, the important thing is to be able to do thermal management. A big part of, uh, of what we've done with the SCR system development, and we really had to do for particulate filters before that, was develop a thermal management system that would allow us to maintain, maintain heat in the exhaust at low ambient temperatures. Um, it's particularly important for a particular filter because you can, you can plug them up uh, and then the engine stops running and you have the failure that we were talking about. So the combination of variable geometry turbochargers, uh, flexible timing with the fuel systems um, has really allowed, and, and exhaust gas recirculation, EGR control, lets us do a much better job of managing the temperature of the exhaust. We can do a particulate regeneration at 40 below zero. Um, and so we can, and we can also maintain uh, the temperature at a reasonably high level for SCR systems uh, over the operating range. So some of the things you hear back from Europe that, uh, you know, the, the vehicles that were in city service were not using uh, urea because the exhaust temperature never got, uh, got hot enough. You know, we sort of anticipated that over here, and so we have the thermal management systems that allow us to do that. We have some data that I think we've shared with you guys before. I can, I can send you some. I imagine there's some industry data as well, but if you're, if you're interested in pursuing that, I can show you some Cummins data over the operating map and uh, over a range of temperatures that show the, the SDR conversion. But we're seeing, you know, 80-plus 80, uh, 80 percent NOx down to relatively low ambient temperatures. Yeah, Tom Piquette, uh, ARB. Um, John, the... Uh, Current standard for NOx is 0.2. What are the prospects for diesels uh, being able to meet 0.02 NOx? 0.02. Or something in that. I don't want to encourage you too much along these lines, I know Tom. you don't, but that's why. <laughs> <laughs> or something in that, in that range. Yeah, I think that um, we're at 0.2. Some of it gets back to John's question that, the, you know, at, so you've got to do it over a duty cycle, and you've got to really anticipate the range and ambient conditions. So if you want to... Uh, look at a, I don't know, a gen set that's running at steady load that you can really dial in the SCR system. You can get quite high conversion rates, but if you've got to worry about startups and, um, and transient operation over a wide range, then I think it's hard to get that high integrated efficiency. So we can take a look at, you, at it with you. you know, we'll, we'll see numbers below 0.2, but I don't know uh, what 0.02 would be like, but you know, I didn't think we were going to be looking at 0.01 particulate when we started working on this either. So, uh, I, so I, it's hard to say no. I, I think we just ought to take a look at it and also understand now the trade-offs between um, NOx and greenhouse gases because as we tend to drive the particulates, the criteria pollutants further and further down, that continues to take more energy. So if we have to do things like more aggressive thermal management, that'll take energy, it takes fuel, and then that makes it harder to hit the CO2 target. So I think what we're going to be seeing going forward now is that how do we strike that balance between the concern over CO2 and greenhouse gases and the criteria pollutants? With a three-way catalyst, you're in a whole different ballgame, but as long as you've got oxygen in the exhaust, it's harder. Yes? Hi, uh, Bob Nguyen, uh, AIB. On one of the slides where you have the particulate matter composition breakdown, um, are we, are we seeing a, a, a net increase or a net decrease in the sulfate emissions? It's kind of a little difficult to Oh, it's a net decrease in the sulfate emissions. At, at, at 10 ppm sulfur fuel, the sulfate emissions are quite low. So the, it's just everything else is so much lower that when you look at the pie chart, it looks like the sulfate emissions, they're a bigger fraction of a much, much smaller pie. So the, the net sulfate emissions are really quite low. 
uh, you know, with a 15 ppm sulfur fuel, you're looking at something more like 10 ppm in use. It's, they're, so they're, they're extremely low, but if you're looking at the solid particle, the composition of that, it's, it's a big fraction. Hi, Steve Mikowski, Dow Chemical. Um, the data you've shown today is pretty impressive from the uh, engine technology and the after-treatment technology. I think most of the data of the new technology diesels had wall flow particulate filters. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm not aware of certifications yet, but there's a lot of talk in the press of the non-road uh, tier four final, some applications coming out without particulate filters. How do you think that would impact some of the data that was shown such as reduction of PAHs and particle numbers? It's a real good question. Certainly the mass emissions would be low because they would meet the, the uh, emissions standards. Uh, to be honest with you, I think we'd need to take a look at the composition of those, uh, of those particulates uh, to understand how the breakdown uh, changes. I would expect the sulfate fraction to be higher uh, because the, hydro the carbon content is, is lower and with the use of oxidation catalysts, you do eliminate a lot of the uh, lighter hydrocarbons. It's just a question of whether or not you can get a significant hit on the heavier PAHs. Mm -hmm. Peter, should we shift gears? We can come back to this. If anybody wants to pick up this trail later on, we can. I'm just a little conscious of cheating Jake out of his turn. All right. Great. Thank you, John. I think uh, John uh, provided a nice uh, prologue to uh, the topic that I'm going to talk about, which shifts gears a little bit and focuses on the utilization of uh, animals uh, to better characterize and understand the health hazard of inhaled diesel exhaust. And uh, what I'm going to do today is give you a little bit of an update on the advanced collaborative emission study, at least phase three of that work, uh, which is managed through, uh, under a contract from the Health Effects Institute to look at uh, the toxicity of inhaled diesel exhaust in r rats and mice. And uh, those studies are underway, but I'm going to give you an interim report on the results from that and, and uh, provide you some information that is going to be published by HEI uh, sometime in April. But I'm also going to provide you with a little bit of uh, uh, ba additional background that sets the stage for some of the work that's been conducted over the past several decades to uh, better characterize the health hazards of diesel exhaust using animals, of course, which is uh, one of the species that you can use, obviously. So in, in, for some historical perspective, we've been looking, we as a, commu as a scientific community, have been trying to understand and better characterize the health hazards associated with inhaled diesel exhaust uh, since the 1950s. Uh, diesel exhaust, as we've known it, has uh, provided emissions uh, that ha have a ubiquitous exposure. And because of the composition and complexity of the emissions uh, and the number of chemicals that are emitted, especially in the older technology, there's plausible human hazards uh, from the emissions that have come from older technology in particular. The diesel exhaust research, especially within the health community, uh, the engine engineers have been studying it from long before the, the 70s, uh, has been a, f a tremendous focus, uh, s especially starting in the 70s, even though the work started in the 50s. Uh, a lot of this started from some, as I'll mention in a little bit, uh, some findings associated with the mutagenicity of diesel exhaust in the early 70s uh, that led to a lot of research and concern over the potential carcinogenicity of inhaled diesel exhaust. Uh, within the health research community, uh, that, that those initial findings related to the mutagenicity of diesel exhaust uh, focused a large microscope under diesel exhaust, but uh, there was really limited parallel attention within the health research community on gasoline engine exhaust. Uh, our, our organization, for example, uh, has almost 140, 150 publications on the health effects of diesel exhaust and maybe five publications on gasoline engine emissions. And we're one of the, the, the top organizations in studying the health hazards of gasoline engine emissions. And so that gives you just a little bit of context in the, the relative emphasis on diesel versus gasoline. Uh, there's, within the health community, uh, just to characterize the, the, the types of people who are providing information to better characterize and understand the health effects of diesel exhaust or 
engine emissions in, in particular, and in fact, environmental pollutants. Uh, in general, uh, there's been a less of an emphasis among an understanding of the emissions among health researchers. Uh, the, and, and this is uh, displayed in, in the literature when you look at a lot of health studies where uh, results, biological results are reported, uh, but in many cases the composition or type of emissions are, are not characterized or not defined. And in some cases this has made it difficult to interpret that literature. Uh, I'm not focusing on epidemiology studies or studies involving humans today, which of course is the most relevant species for understanding health hazards to humans, uh, but it is noteworthy that, that the uh, epidemiology studies in the database has shown associations with a number of health effects uh, with occupations that where, where diesel exhaust exposure is plausible. Uh, the majority of that literature is, is um, tempered because of the limited or poor documentation of the actual exposures. Uh, usually a lot of the, the associations are based on uh, job function or duties, and a lot of times we don't know exact exposures when you're recreating the potential health effects of that diesel exhaust, which makes it difficult in some cases to uh, better asso best associate health effects asso in, 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 that, in those populations. The animal studies, which are used to inform our understanding of animal studies and inform how we go about and interpret and regulate and associate the risk associated with uh, any materials. They, in the diesel exhaust context, they started in the late 70s, early 80s, looking at uh, health hazards and, and uh, cancer associated with inhaled diesel exhaust. And they found that diesel exhaust indeed caused cancer in laboratory rats. Uh, but a decade long of additional research, research uh, looking at cancer in rats and in a number of other laboratory animal species uh, tempered the enthusiasm and the interpretation of those results and suggesting that the cancer that was found in the rats may be specific to that particular species and may not be due to the fact that it was diesel exhaust and to carcinogenic material in diesel exhaust, but rather to the effects of an overwhelming dose that was achieved of mater particulate material that may be non not selective or not specific towards diesel exhaust in particular. And I'll give you an example of that later on. So that, that led to them not, led to a, uh, the EPA in particular recently in their evaluation of health hazard of diesel exhaust uh, to temper their emphasis on the utilization of laboratory animals in looking at the uh, cancer hazard of inhaled diesel exhaust. Of course, while cancer is a driver for a lot of the risk assessment associated with diesel, uh, there's a lot of non-cancer effects, uh, the inflammation, and a range of cardiovascular and other effects that have been documented both in uh, laboratory animal studies in our lab and others, as well as controlled effects in humans as well and, and uh, occupational studies. Uh, the majority, in fact, almost all of the research database that's on diesel exhaust of course is based on technology that is prior to 2007. Uh, certainly all of that, all of the research in humans and the majority of it in animals, in fact very little has been studied until recently on new technology and its impact on the potential change in the health response to inhaled materials. So looking back at, at where the cancer hazard in particular for diesel exhaust started in terms of uh, it getting attention goes back to uh, 1955 and in, in early on looking at uh, taking solvent extracts of diesel and gasoline exhaust material and doing a uh, mouse skin painting it, painting it on the skins of, of mice and they found that when they took those extracts and painted that material onto the skins of mice they did see uh, increase in tumors on the um, mouse skin. Uh, they related that to source operating condition and the aromatic hydrocarbons co content of those emissions. We really started a flurry of research, as I mentioned earlier, in the 70s when they found that the, within the Ames mutagenicity assay, where you look at mutations in uh, salmonella bacteria, they found that diesel exhaust in particular had high potency towards causing mutations within Ames, uh, which at the time was a, a well utilized and to the day is well utilized as an in vitro assessment of potential mutagenicity potential. 
uh, a lot of work with, with diesel exhaust and doing studies using biodirected fractionation uh, pointed towards nitroaromatic compounds as being the important or putative compounds that was causing the mutagenicity in those extracts. And what biodirected fractionation is, is you, you would take material, for example, if uh, you have a filter of material, you extract it, and then you want to find out if this material, that extract, causes some mutagenicity within that assay. If you wanted to know what component within that extract is actually causing that, that, that mutagenicity, what they would do is then separate it out and parse that out chemically and through chemical and physical separation until they were able to identify the extracts and then eventually the compounds uh, that were causing the mutagenic response within that particular assay. And again, nitroaromatic compounds were identified as being the most important from diesel exhaust. So a lot of that work during the 1970s caused, uh, again, a lot of interest in the potential cancer-causing potential of diesel exhaust. And so in the late 70s and early 80s, a number of large-scale rodent studies began. Uh, this, this occurred both in the US, Germany, Switzerland, and Japan. And studies were consistent uh, across a number of studies that were conducted across the world. And in each of these, they found that especially at the highest doses, of, dil of diluted exhaust based on usually typically diluted down to high doses of particulate ma material, high concentrations of particulate matter, uh, those high doses caused lung tumors in rats. They did not see the same increase in lung tumors in mice or Syrian hamsters. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, and we'll get an example in a second, uh, they, they associated this excess lung tumors in a specific, uh, uh, in a specific species specific relation to the particle overload that is occurring in those animals. And, and one an additional example of, of the mutagenicity studies that were conducted, these ones in particular at our laboratory, also identified the importance of understanding the differences in operating conditions within diesel engines or within any uh, vehicle on both the composition, as we would understand, but also potentially the toxicity, in this case manifested by uh, the Ames Mugenicity assay, where, where a study was pu published by Bechtel using a 1980 GM 5.7 liter uh, certification fuel, et cetera, uh, operating an engine on an FTP cycle in, in, in a driving cycle and collecting different fractions of emissions during that cycle and finding that you had different amounts of mutagenicity depending on the component of that cycle that was linked to differences in composition. John covered that topic. So uh, the mutagenicity was one point, and, and again, uh, what a lot led to a lot of the interest was the results from these rat studies that, that showed a increase in t a dose-dependent increase in tumor burden for rats exposed seven hours a day, five days a week, uh, for a lifespan study in a rodent, which is about 30 months, to whole diesel exhaust. Whole means you capture both the gas phase and the particle phase, and they're, they're living within chambers that they're exposed to. And as you can see, uh, where that x-axis here is, is soot concentration times time, or the amount of time that they're exposed on the x-axis, and on the y-axis is uh, the, the in, it, it percent increase in tumor incidence. As you can see, there was a dose-dependent increase. And what, was, what occurred with, with these particular studies and these data uh, was that, that uh, the, there was a projection of the lowest dose, because we had a linear response through these data, uh, to projecting that potentially that, that tumor burden or, or that tumors or cancer could occur at lower concentrations, much below the concentration shown here to pr that provided excess tumor burden. But if you looked at the lower concentrations that were evaluated during those studies, and these studies were evaluated with a high number of animals to enhance the probability of detecting a potential excess, excess tumor burden, uh, what they found was that there was not an increase in tumor in rats at the lower doses that were evaluated. Uh, suggesting, uh, because of the way that these studies were powered, uh, that, that that the lower doses may not be able to be adequately extrapolated from the higher doses to predict an excess in potential for cancer. The other, the other interesting component of the story was the notion that, that they wanted to understand more in these studies that were conducted about the potential for the mutagenic 
components of diesel exhaust, the, these things that were identified in particular in Ames assays as being mutagenic. We wanted to understand the role of the organic carbon fraction in causing the, the uh, cancer and the excess tumors that were identified. And so a series of studies were conducted to try and understand uh, that potential role. And the way that they conducted those studies uh, was to look at carbon black, or material that, that was void or, or de deficient in organic carbon, and compare that to diesel exhaust and other, other types of material in different laboratories at the same particle, particulate matter concentration and over lifetime studies. And what they found was that the same types of exposures uh, that, that, that at d different diesel, at different particle concentrations, that the dose response, if you look here at the x-axis, which is the same uh, cumulative exposure dose response type of x-axis that I was showing in the prior slide, and then the y-axis again, looking at uh, uh, excess lung tumors. As you can see, if you look here up in the, the far corner, these are uh, Printex 90 and titanium. These are uh, different types of particulate materials, non-diesel exhaust, at, at, at those concentrations, those doses. And they looked at diesel soot, as well as looking at carbon black, and they found that you could superimpose almost the, particular, the, the dose of particulate matter with the percent increase in tumor burden. And so when I was first learning of this story, uh, you know, it, it, the, the notion was that, that, that this, because this is a, potentially a nonspecific response, it's not addressed through a mutagenic, mutagenic mechanism, it's not related to the organic carbon fraction of diesel exhaust, you could, you could grind up this carpet or this podium here, and potentially if you got it into a sufficiently small size to aerosolize it and be inhaled by rats at the same concentration and the same dose, that it, it would likely cause the same tumor burden as diesel exhaust did. And so it was, it was considered a very nonspecific effect that was seen in rats. And again, they did not see the same type of excess cancer burden in mice or hamsters. And that's, that's what an, it led to, unfortunately, a t or, or the way it is, a, a tempering of uh, our ability to utilize these data to better understand the health hazard associated with cancer in humans. So I'm going to shift gears now and talk about the Advanced Collaborative Emissions Study. Uh, again, this study is conducted under contract uh, by our laboratory, Loveless Respiratory Research Institute. Uh, this phase of the study is Phase 3B, uh, managed for the, by Health Effects Institute, funded by a combination of government and industry. And the focus of this these series of studies is to better understand the, both the toxicity and eventually the carcinogenicity potential of 2007 compliant diesel exhaust. That's the study that's undergoing right now. The study started off, like any study, with a null hypothesis. And that hypothesis written here was that the emissions will have very low pollutant levels and will not cause an increase in tumor formation or substantial toxic effects in rats or mice at the highest concentration of exhaust that can be used compared with animals exposed to clean air, although some biological effects may occur. The study design was not developed by Lovelace. It was developed by a consortium uh, that was managed uh, by the Health Effects Institute, and it was uh, uh, vetted through an ex external advisory panel. The design uh, was based in large part, especially for the carcinogenicity com component, on the uh, cancer design for studies conducted by the uh, National Toxicology Program, uh, where you're looking at cancer as an endpoint, but utilizing a number of biological endpoints that are well vetted through the National Toxicology Program. And again, similar to studies that are conducted by the National Toxicology Program, the design of the study was developed so that, such that you would have effects at biological responses at the highest effect level. And that the, the potentially, depending on the outcome of the study, you may then go down to lower effects levels to potentially identify a no observable effect level as well as a, 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 a level at the highest level that would cause a biological response. That was the design of the study. The core study design uh, was a bioassay, which you know, bioassay in this context means a lifetime study conducted in the Wistar-Hahn rat. Uh, the, the Wistar-Hahn rat was selected because of its low background and especially lung tumor incidence. Uh, the rat was selected at uh, the, the animal uh, d doses looked at here, in and also the animal numbers. Uh, 
the animal numbers were selected to be able to see a statistically significant increase of a, at least a 5% increase in tumor burden in terms of the animal numbers that were evaluated. An exposure paradigm, looking at 16 hours a day of exposure, five days a week for up to 30 months, depending on the uh, survivability of the animals, was developed. Three dilutions of whole emissions, a high emission set at a level that was known to or believed to cause a biological response, and clean air controls were evaluated. And 166 per group were evaluated for the carcinogenicity assay and then other animals were uh, selected to be looked at at interim sacrifice points. In addition to the, the cancer endpoints, additional biological responses were looked at for respiratory function at 3, 12, and 24 months. Uh, wash lung lavage, or when you wash out the lung uh, with a saline solution to be able to look at increases in proteins and inflammatory cells and things like that. Uh, lung tissue, we're looking at lung tissue uh, both uh, under a microscope by a trained uh, uh, pathologist to understand and see if there's any uh, tissue changes or tissue remodeling or tissue injury, as well as biochemical assays within lung tissue to understand if there's increases inflammation or proteins that might tell us something about what's going on in the lung. Uh, hematology and serum chemistry in blood to look at potential effects and uh, systemic inflammatory or, or toxic responses that could occur. Uh, and then again, histopathology that was used to look at the lung tissue response. The bioscreening study in mice, which was a parallel activity, was occurred. And the mouse studies were conducted to better understand species comparisons uh, between rats and mice in terms of their sensitivity to this, uh, uh, this to particular types of uh, uh, atmosphere, uh, as well as to enable some ancillary studies that were conducted under separate contracts by the Health Effects Institute uh, to look at some non-standard biological response assays, and I'm not going to talk about those today. The, in this particular s study, it was up, up, to up to 13 weeks, 120 mice per group, exposed to the same uh, protocol. Uh, many of the same biological response indicators were looked at up to three months. Uh, that is in parallel to the ancillary studies that were conducted in these mice. The exhaust generation, uh, th this, the, the system the, the stu these studies are unique relative to the, uh, many of the diesel exhaust studies that have been conducted in the past in that typically the, uh, the, the diesel engine facilities have been a low, lower horsepower, lo lower uh, types of uh, energy output. Uh, this is a larger engine. Uh, it was rated up to a 600 horsepower fa uh, engine facility. Uh, the engine is operating on an alternating current dynamometer through a specially designed cycle that was designed uh, for the program to be an, a very aggressive cycle that incorporates a number of different modes that would really test the bounds of the, uh, the rigor of the engine as well as the rigor of the uh, engine after treatment and the ability to maintain uh, the, the emissions reduction that it was originally designed for. And this is conducted, again, on a very aggressive cycle, 16 hours a day, five days a week. I guarantee that in John's labs, he's never run an engine that long under these types of cycles. It's, it's a very, it's a very uh, impressive feat to be able to ensure uh, that these systems can be running for five days a week, 16 hours a day, not because of the st stability of their system, but these are very complicated, integrated systems that we're maintaining, and we've, we've had a lot of success in doing that. The, the exhaust is, is uh, diluted after going through the DPF. Uh, in, the, in the standard after-treatment system that goes into a, a, a dilution system that you can see here. I'll see if I can use this pointer here. It goes up here into the, the primary dilution system here. This is where the engine exhaust goes up into that dilution system. Uh, the, that dilution system then, the, the emissions are routed here into a laboratory that, are, uh, that is immediately adjacent to the engine control laboratory. Uh, it, within that laboratory, you have a uh, engine exhaust takeoff point, and uh, th this picture on the lower left-hand side is looking within the dilution tunnel, and those are the ports, the, the probes that are in line with the exhaust as it's flowing down the, ch down the tunnel. 
and uh, each one of those are different size ports for the different amount of exhaust that would need to be extracted for each of the different exposure levels. Uh, the, the top left-hand picture is an outer schematic of the probes uh, go into the dilution tunnel to extract the exhaust. Uh, the dilution, the air, air is extracted, uh, and then as you can see on the right-hand side schematic, uh, it goes through a, a muffler to dampen the, the sound. Uh, there's additional dilution steps in what we call dump or a bypass of uh, air to balance flow within the chambers. And then the, the uh, final dilution of material goes into the, uh, the ex exposure chamber here, and the animals live within this chamber. It's a flow-through chamber. Uh, this is a two cubic meter size chamber. The animals uh, spend their lifetime within this chamber, within caging. Uh, they're allowed uh, free access to water and food uh, during that time. They uh, there's multiple uh, chambers for each level, and the caging for each level are modified to ensure that the animals have adequate space for during their lifestyle and as during their lifespan and as they grow. So the I mentioned several times earlier that the concentrations were that the expo the concentrations were set at a level that would at a dilution level at the highest level that would likely ensure a biological response. And that, that, that was ensured by the study design uh, based uh, on the historical data on the effects of NOx on uh, lung and other effects. And so the highest concentration was, and in, in all of the concentrations were defined based on the dilution indicator of NO2. And you, utilizing NO2 as a dilution indicator for each of the different exposure levels, we would then characterize the rest of the composition of the emissions as they existed at those, at those dilutions. Uh, the highest exposure target for NO2 is 4.2 ppm, uh, followed by 0.8 and 0.1 ppm for the NO2 concentrations. Uh, the concentrations of other constituents of the atmosphere are then uh, trended or tracked as they did and as we characterized. Uh, these are the concentrations, the average exposure concentrations uh, up through 12 months, uh, which is the, d uh, the data, uh, which is the longest duration of uh, exposure for the data that I may present, to, that I'm presenting today. Uh, as you can see, the concentration of NO2 is just looking at the high exposure level at, at a, a target of 4.2 ppm. Uh, you have about 5.8 ppm of NO. Uh, just for context, the, the one of the main contrasts in the composition uh, from, uh, of the emissions as we see it, in addition to the reduced particulate matter and things like that, the, the NOx from all of our older studies, uh, and in the majority of older studies in the literature, if you look at NOx, typically the average integrated NOx over a duty cycle uh, was about 90% NO and about 10% NO2. So for these studies here, it's, it's more you know, 60, 40 or so. There's, there's, so as a proportion of the exhaust, especially for this 2007 compliant emissions, uh, there was an increase in the amount of NO2. Uh, this is uh, carbon monoxide, hydrocarbon, SO2. Sorry, the units there are in part per billion for the SO2. Uh, the particulate matter, as John mentioned earlier, one of the challenges is in measuring the particulate matter that come from uh, the exhaust here. And we had those same challenges. And so one of the things we had to do because of the dander and, and uh, uh, background that comes from having a, a large population within a confined space, uh, there is a natural background of particulate matter within the exposure chambers that the animals exist in. Uh, that background is typically about 25 to 30 micrograms per cubic meter of particulate matter that's associated primarily with dander. And so what we had to do to better associate the, uh, the concentrations that were directly related to the diesel exhaust was to actually take samples, if you have an, a, a chamber, to take samples immediately prior to the exposure chamber, prior to it entering into, into the chamber itself, so that we could better understand the contribution of diesel exhaust to the particulate matter. And we did a series of studies prior to putting animals into the chamber to verify that we could measure immediately prior to the chamber and then what's in the chamber and that those results would, would agree in terms of uh, our ability to represent what the animals were exposed to. And so that's why I report data in terms of the chamber inlet at nine, microgra nine micrograms per cubic meter at the high exposure level and that's compared to about 30 micrograms per cubic meter uh, that's in the chamber that, that results primarily again from background. Uh, just, just for reference here, 
so this is 9 micrograms per cubic meter at this dilution. Uh, some of the higher concentrations for the, the uh, older diesel studies that we're uh, uh, referencing earlier that, that, uh, that were used for a some of those earlier cancer studies, uh, those were on the order of uh, you know, between 5 and 10 milligrams per cubic meter or 5 and 10 thousand micrograms per cubic meter. So a substantial difference in not only the amount of particulate matter that was in these atmospheres relative to those studies, uh, but also, as John pointed out earlier, in the composition of those emissions. Uh, as John mentioned, they're, they're, they're the, the interesting, perhaps the most interesting part in term, from an atmosphere perspective in these, in these exposure chambers occurs during the regeneration of the, of the, the, the diesel particle trap. And so what I'm showing you here are two figures that re represent uh, real-time particle mass on the top figure and real-time particle number on the bottom figure. Uh, for the top figure, that arrow from side to side represents one 16-hour exposure duration. Typically what we have during one 16-hour exposure period operating on this duty cycle are two regenerations of that trap. When that trap regeneration occurs, we see both a change in the composition of the gas phase, the NO to NO2 burden, as you would imagine, because uh, NO2 is utilized as, uh, to help regenerate the trap. We also see, at that point, an increase in the particle mass and particle number uh, that comes from the trap as, as a result of that regeneration process. And so as you see here, uh, it, it may be a little bit difficult to see in the back of the room, but uh, just the, the peak particle mass concentration it can go up to 100, 150 micrograms per cubic meter for a relatively short period of time. Uh, if you integrate the time during the exposure, uh, so, so just for calibration, each of those regeneration events takes about 90 minutes. Okay, it's 60 to 90 minutes. And during that regeneration period, the average particle concentration is about 50 micrograms per cubic meter. So during a few hours of that 16-hour cycle on each given day, the exposure concentration based on particle mass, which is one component of the whole exhaust that we're interested in, uh, is about 50 micrograms per cubic meter. Uh, particle number. Uh, which is represented on the bottom slide. And what we had to do with this particular slide, because of the nature of the software we're working with, is uh, break down the two uh, eight-hour periods within the 16 hours in two separate slides. So what we're looking at on the bottom uh, figure is the same information in general, but it's particle number instead of particle mass, and showing that, that during, the dura during the majority of the time that you're looking at the particle number in that exposure chamber, you don't see anything. But during two events, that we see for both particle number and mass, we do see a spike in number and mass because of the regeneration event that occurs. And th this slide is meant to mostly tell you that the characterization that was conducted for these exposure atmospheres that will be published in the, uh, the, the upcoming uh, uh, report that's going to be uh, presented by HEI uh, is is been extensive. We measured you know hundreds of individual components uh, to characterize the composition and magnitude of, of the uh, ma material within the within these atmospheres, including semi-volatiles, PAH, nitro PAH, et cetera, et cetera. It's always interesting to look at uh, these atmospheres in the context of the total amount of material as it exists as a percentage. Uh, oftentimes we look at uh, material and, and emissions in different units, and sometimes that can be, I don't know if it's misleading because we're used to looking at it in that way, uh, but if you put things on the same units, you always, you'll note that not only for modern technology diesel exhaust, but also older technology diesel exhaust, the majority of the emissions are, of course, CO2 and water. Uh, after that, it's mostly NOx and CO, and then particulate matter is a very small fraction, even in older technology diesel exhaust, but particular, particularly here. And so if you look at that top figure on the top here, you see mostly gas phase, but among the small amount of particle mass that's there, if you look at the composition, you see a fair amount of, you know, on the high side, especially you see a fair amount of organic carbon, uh, sulfate elements, et cetera. So the, the study was conducted and has conducted as, design, as, as defined in that table. Uh, and, and a number of biological responses, in addition to the, the characterization of the atmospheres, was evaluated. And these were evaluated using a statistical approach uh, that was developed as part of a statistical working group. Uh, and that statistical approach uh, was applied uh, to evaluate the biological response relative to clean air controls and relative to trends within groups.
<coughs> the biological response indicators uh, that, you know, as a, as a sort of natural manifestation of the protocols that are utilized to look at the toxicity uh, uh, within these types of protocols, like the National Toxicology Program utilizes, there's a number of measurements. Uh, within hematology and serum chemistry, just as a natural part of the, the data that you get, there's a wide number of measurements that you make, uh, which, you know, so it makes us sensitive to potential uh, uh, type 2 statistical errors for just potentially false positives, and we pay close attention to that. But the point of this is not to list off every biological endpoint, but to note that there are many within hematology and serum chemistry. Uh, within lung lavage, we looked at a number of different uh, protein and other indicators. Uh, lung tissue, we looked at a lot of indicators of both inflammatory and, and potentially oxidative response. Uh, we also looked at respiratory function, which is a somewhat of a non-standard assay relative to the National Toxicology Program studies. Uh, and we looked at pathology and tissue pathology as, as well as organ weights, etc. <coughs> The, the findings, just to uh, preempt what I'm going to discuss, is that the majority of the analyses, the majority of those endpoints, those biological responses we looked at, really showed no difference between diesel exhaust and clean air control. Uh, the histopathology analysis did reveal mild to minimal, and those terms are pathology terms. Those are not my terms. Those are what pathology designates as the severity of the response. Um, so, so those are mild to minimal exposure-related hyperplasia in the rats after three months of exposure that was not observed in the mice. Uh, this increased, the, the amount of hyperplasia increased at 12 months, but was still classified by a board-certified pathologist as well as peer review as being considered mild or mi minimal se severity. Uh, the statistical significant findings were noted for several indicators of uh, what we call pulmonary stress and inflammation in rats. And mice, there were much fewer findings in the mice. I'm going to note some of the findings in the rats. And all of it will be published in this publication coming up next month. Uh, respiratory function or pulmonary function assessments in the rats uh, showed slight differences in respiratory function in exposed rats compared with control after three months as well as at 12 months of exposure for one of the particular endpoints. So there, wa there were several endpoints looking at protein and albumin in rats that at the highest exposure level we saw uh, some increase. Uh, at the and this is shown in these uh, top figures and those were statistically significant. Uh, the total antioxidant capacity as well as heme oxygenase, heme oxygenase, which is a stress response protein shown in the lower two figures. Uh, the antioxidant capacity, if that goes down, that is showing an increase in oxidative stress. Uh, we saw an increase in ox that, that response at each of the exposure levels, uh, except for the control. Uh, we saw an increase in heme oxygenase uh, at the high exposure level as well as the mid. Uh, it appears to trend, but we did not see that at the low or the control. The, these are relatively mild, but statistically significant increases for these response after three months of exposure. Uh, we measured a number of different respiratory function, respiratory uh, uh, responses in, in rats. Uh, we uh, looked at respiratory function in a way that allowed us to look at a, a, a much larger number of animals than we had looked at in any of the pre previous studies that we had utilized. Uh, we had uh, an N of 10 per gender. And uh, we looked at both, of, uh, both effects uh, based on individual gender. And uh, to the ex extent w that it made sense and the data could be normalized, we also looked at pooled genders with males and females together uh, when we felt there may not be a gender-specific response. Uh, we did observe a, a trend, in, uh, a statistically significant trend, in a decrease in uh, lung diffusion capacity measured as, uh, or as the, the lung's ability to take up oxygen. Uh, measured by a, in, in, uh, the addition of car a small amount of carbon monoxide uh, to the lungs and seeing how well that the lungs would take up that carbon monoxide when you extracted it out. And we found that there was in, indeed a, an apparent exposure-related trend in a, uh, the decrease in this lung diffusion capacity. Again, uh, th then these data are shown here on the bottom right-hand side for the three-month uh, responses, and we, uh, in that case, I'm showing each of the genders, uh, and in the top left-hand side, I'm showing this is a pooled gender. Uh, and in, in both cases, we saw a statistically significant trend, but if you look at the high exposure uh, versus control alone, that was not statistically significant. 
And if you look at uh, the each gender on their own without being pooled, it was not statistically significant. So the pooling of the genders, which gave us an of 20, uh, was able to in decrease the relative uh, standard deviation and allow a statistically significant response to be observed. <clears throat> so the histopathology findings, uh, where, where the pathologist would uh, take slides of uh, all the tissues in the rats and mice and, and look to see if there's any tissue injury, uh, we did, we did not, the, the pathologist did not observe any systemic tissue injury that is outside of the port of entry or in the nasal or in the lungs. Uh, they did see some uh, tissue remodeling and changes within the nasal region as well as in the lungs as a result of these exposures. Uh, this is uh, just an, a, a table of incidents at the 3 and 12 month, uh, uh, three and 12 month studies. This is just indicating the uh, number within 10 animals that were evaluated, uh, the types of findings that were observed, and of those 10 animals that they looked at, how many out of the 10 saw th where they saw this ob observation. Uh, primarily what they were seeing is in, in the asner region of the lung, uh, which if you guys can imagine your uh, grade school picture of, of the lung, you're coming down, you see the grapes and where the, the, the airways come down and kind of distend down into the, the air sacs and things like that, right when you're change, turning that corner into this, uh, this was called the asner region of the lung. Uh, sometimes pathologists argue whether it's periasiner or asiner. We'll just call it the same for us, for our sakes. Uh, and and in this, this is the, the, the area of the lung uh, where we, we're seeing the, uh, the tissue changes here for these particular studies, just for that description. And so uh, we saw that in all of the animals, both at the three month and the 12 month, uh, the, 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 the note that it's not evaluated not yet is, is untrue relative to the accumulation of macrophages. The point is, actually, we did not see an accumulation of macrophages at the high, high level. Uh, we did see a, a note of fibrotic tissue. It's important to note the difference between fibrosis, which is uh, idiopathic disease, which is very severe, and the notation of fibrotic type tissue, which is a type of tissue remodeling, a type of cell, cell modification. So just to give a couple of pictures of this, looking at, at uh, what we're looking at here, this is just uh, uh, pi uh, pictures where we took lungs, uh, stained them with a special type of stain, and then uh, the pathologist had looked at these, and they, they uh, noted here uh, th this area that we're pointing out with the arrows, which is in what we call the alveolar duct region. Uh, that you see that, uh, hopefully you can appreciate the thickening in that area of the stain, uh, which is a thickening of, of, of tissue in that area relative to what you see in the control. And if you look a little bit closer, I think you can probably see that even better, where you see the thickening of the alveolar duct right there at what's called the septa, right where it's uh, entering into the alveolar duct region. And if you look at uh, 12 months, what we're finding is that uh, at three months, you see, I think, the start here of the top figure, uh, where you see just at the, the, the initial part of this uh, uh, asner region here, or that where, where the uh, air is coming into that area, you'll see that the initial thickening of those airways. And if you look at 12 months, you, I think you can probably appreciate that that, uh, that thickening is extending on and, and, and gr growing in terms of its footprint within the asner region. And uh, we're, we're continuing to see at the 12-month evaluation point uh, this thickened septae with an increase in, at some point, these fibrous tissues uh, that are remodeling. And we see, in some cases, in a couple of animals, also uh, uh, tissue remodeling that is also showing uh, changes in the tissue type, showing bronchialization or, or basically uh, shift into uh, cells that are uh, cuboidal, cuboidal type cells that actually have cilia on them, so they look more like uh, bronchiolar type cells as opposed to alveolar type cells. So we are seeing some tissue remodeling. And, and note again that these were observed in all of the animals at the high level, and that, that again, that the severity score where a pathologist will rank the relative severity of these findings on a scale of zero basically to four. The, the score of, of all of these was typically, a, was, was almost in all cases, a one. And I don't think we saw any, maybe one or two uh, uh, findings where it may have been a one or two. But, but pretty much it was a one out of a four scale in terms of the severity of the findings. Again, defined by the pathologist as minimal to mild. So uh, certainly uh, both by study design as well as the, the observation that uh, nitrogen dioxide uh, 
is a large component of the emissions that we're looking at, coupled to the fact that nitrogen dioxide is a known uh, toxicant. Uh, it's, it's likely important to look at the potential for NO2 uh, to be important in driving some of the biological responses that are observed. Uh, essentially, when, when this particular study was designed, I mentioned earlier, it was designed on the notion that there would be biological responses at the high level. And that was developed based on prior studies on the toxicity of NO2. Uh, and the doses that were selected were, for, were based on NO2 uh, studies that were conducted prior, where uh, we, we observed in, in a prior study that, that moderately published in the late 80s, uh, when, when F344 rats were exposed to just low, less than 10 ppm NO2, uh, they looked at pulmonary function, histopath, uh, some of the immune or inflammatory response indicators. Uh, they, they found that NO2, uh, you know, parallel to this study in some ways, uh, caused epithelial hyperplasia. Uh, thickening of walls of terminal bronchioles, inflammation, and oxidative stress. Uh, in that study, there was little effect on respiratory function. I, I do note that, that that study, is my recollection, was not powered as well as this study was for the respiratory function measurement. Uh, the effects at 12 months for that study was not significantly different than at the 24 months that it did not progress. Uh, the, again, the NO2 doses for the 12-month study here uh, for ACEs were selected to be nearly identical to that prior study on NO2. If you look at the concentration time, time the moderately study was about 17,000 ppm hours of NO2 exposure as well as in the, that's pretty close to what we saw in the ACEs study. In summary, the 2007 compliant diesel emissions are different. Uh, there's lower stuff and coming out of the tailpipe. As a result of that, there's uh, a different difference in the complexity and the type of the emissions. And as a result, these studies show a difference in the composition of the atmospheres that are being studied uh, for diesel exhaust relative to the historical literature in this area. Uh, they do have some interesting differences in the proportion of Edon 2 etc. Uh, the exposures up through a year produced mild to no response in the mice, and minimal inflammatory and tissue remodeling and respiratory function and changes in rats. I use that term minimal again, uh, you know, not for myself to classify the ra relative ranking of the responses, but because that was the clinical term used by the pathologist to define the relative tissue response in these animals. Again, the tissue response was considered minimal. Uh, the statistically significant findings were observed primarily at the high level, but we did see some at the lower levels, and will be interesting to see. Uh, in the respiratory function effects, we observed trends. Uh, we saw those trends both at three months and at 12 months. The relative magnitude of those trends and the responses uh, did not appear to progress between three and 12 months. They're reasonably consistent. And again, the, the remainder of the study is currently underway. Uh, the, the schedule, as we look at right now, uh, we're scheduled for our two-month sacrifice this spring, uh, and then uh, at that point we'll look at respiratory function, number of these other endpoints. Uh, the current plan, which is based on the survival curves and survivability of the animals, is to extend the animals out to 30 months based on their lifespan, and to look at 30-month time span, which will occur uh, later on this uh, in, in November. And we'll look at those for the potential for increase in cancer incidence as well as other endpoints and a draft report on these results for the final report will be submitted next June. Obviously, I didn't do all of this, and these are the, the people who take the credit. A lot of technicians and technical support went into conducting this research and continues to do this on a daily basis. Thank you. If you have any questions for Jake, I'm here to pass them along. <laughs> Hi, uh, Steve Rankus at the Department of Pesticide Regulation. I'm just uh, wondering in this uh, Whistler rat that you're using, what would be uh, air chemical, uh, these, I guess it'd be gases that cause lung, the lung cancer that you're interested in, that they, you know, the they've been shown to cause a cancer in the Wistar rat. Uh, 
You know, I don't know the I, I don't know the answer to that question. The the historical literature on Wister Hans and when there have been uh, tumor incidents related to a particular chemical or material, uh, especially for a lung uh, uh, target. Because I, I guess I'm bringing it up is because my understanding is, for example, if you were to give these same rats uh, cigarette smoke, which you we know causes lung cancer in humans, that you won't get it. Well, I'm not, I'm not sure about the Wistar Han, Han rats. rats. I, I know that there was, uh, there was a lot of literature uh, related to looking at uh, lung cancer and tumor incidence in, in rats in general in, in, in a number of rodent species uh, with tobacco smoke. And for years, the folklore and the, the actuality for the way that those studies were conducted was that you did not see an increase in cancer in, in laboratory animals from tobacco smoke. Uh, but those uh, more recently, uh, new studies were conducted to show that uh, it was really the protocol that the animals were being exposed and how they were being used in those tobacco studies. And that was why they didn't see the, the increase in, in tumor incidence in, in, in rodents. So in a quick uh, anecdote, what they would do was to simulate someone puffing on a cigarette. They would give puffs of tobacco smoke and uh, the, the, that did not lead to a dose administration that was uh, large enough to yield a, uh, a cancer burden. But if you were to put animals in whole body chambers so that they were always immersed in smoke the entire time, they didn't have a chance to uh, modulate how they were breathing material in, uh, then they did indeed get cancer. And in fact, those, those studies both in rats and mice were published by our la laboratory about in the past decade. While we're waiting on the mic, although it's not in my field, you, as you can imagine, there was a huge discussion about which animals to use uh, for the study at the very beginning. If you're interested in that, um, I'm sure we could go back to the HEI and you could see some of the considerations that were made at that time. Hi, um, Mohan Krishnamurthy, engineer at uh, ARB. So uh, I'm not a biologist or a pathologist to understand why certain animals are chosen and on a broader scale, it looks like why would rodents be chosen? I mean, are they a good surrogate to show response in humans for pulmonary or any respiratory responses to smoke? And that's one part of it. The other part of it, um, you as a human being, you respond. I mean, you, the way you refer to the laboratory rats or as some piece of equipment, has there been any progress in testing in vitro or in vivo? The uh, results you show are all in vivo, I assume. Um, has there been any development in terms of not using laboratory animals for these kind of studies? And where do we stand in that? Well, certainly, I think you asked two questions there. Uh, the first is the utility of the rodent to represent humans. Uh, and the answer is they're not very good. Uh, you know, the most relevant species for evaluating the cancer causing effects of diesel exhaust is people. And, uh, but we are utilizing for this particular study, and for most studies that we have, the limitations that we have, uh, you know, animals as a surrogate, and it's important to be able to understand the limitations of those species. And that's why I wanted to give the preamble that noted the limitations, both in rats as well as mice and other species, and being able to use those to predict and understand the potential for toxicity as well as cancer potential in people. Uh, while animals are not the best predictor of humans, we've had, we've, we've, we've had even a harder time with in vitro systems. Um, there's been a lot of uh, work in that area. In fact, EPA and the National Toxicology Program, as well as our colleagues in Europe and around, and around the world, have put a lot of uh, emphasis and resource uh, towards trying to utilize in vitro systems to enhance our ability to reduce the number of animals that are utilized for studies like this, uh, to re reduce the cost and reduce the efficiency, uh, and hopefully in the end enhance the relevance of the utilization of in vitro uh, materials so that not, not only can reduce cost, uh, but, but enhance our ability to better understand the, the risk of materials. Um, that's a work in progress. I'm, I'm Brandon, Brandon Rose with ARB, and I'll try to put the question together that 
sort of combines, we saw uh, during the regeneration event is when you saw your exposure. Um, and, and to me, what's coming out the tailpipe during a regeneration, you know, what, what component is coming out sort of the John, um, and then what are we seeing as that actual part of the exposure? And I'm sort of looking for more information, how those two combine together um, would sort of be my question or comment. Yeah, and just, just, just for clarification, um, and, I, and I can see how I would mislead people with, the, with that slide, uh, there is exposure to material during the entire uh, 16 hours. The particulate matter component of the exposure is highest during the regeneration period. But the, but the gas phase is, is, in fact, the you NO2 exposures, which may be important for the responses we're observing, are actually higher during the non-regeneration period. Um, the, the composition during that, you know, I'm sure John may have the answers on that. What I can, you know, surmise is that we see changes in, uh, when we have real-time measurements, we see changes in the, the composition of the gas phase, you decrease in NO2, increase in NO, uh, but we also, uh, and, and if you consider that the majority of the particulate matter comes during that period, likely the reflection of what we see in the composition is, is probably from what we see during the regeneration period. That, that's, I guess, but. Yeah, typically, there, there are a number of things. Jerry Liu and Dave Kittleson have published on what happens during regeneration and looking at the composition. So it is, as you get things hot uh, and you're injecting fuel, especially if you're injecting fuel to kick off the regeneration, then you'll see some increase in hydrocarbons, although not so much. You'll see increase in sulfate emissions. The, um, uh, but the, it, everything has still got to go through the filter in order to be able to get out. And so you're not seeing a release of high hydrocarbons, or it's not like you're getting raw exhaust during regeneration that you wouldn't be getting another time. You know that, but just to say it for everybody else. Yeah. Um, yes. Hi. Uh, it looks like we don't have any other uh, questions here. And with that, I'd like to wrap up this uh, chair's research seminar. It's been very interesting. I'd like to thank Dr. McDonald and Dr. Wall. Uh, my name, by the way, is Stanley Young. I'm the communications director at uh, ARB. And I wanted to let you all know that at 11.30, we will be holding a press conference downstairs on 11th Street. And there is also a showcase of the latest clean diesel technologies down there. And I invite you all to avail yourselves of this opportunity to see what uh, industry has done in terms of meeting the standards that we're setting. Uh, with that, I'd like to say thank you very much and see you outside on 11th Street. Okay. Nice. Hey, thanks very much for your help. That was terrific. And they're off. Yes. Yeah. Don Shipley, I'm a I know. Uh, producer contracted by diesel to uh -huh. cover this. And I'd like to give interviews with the two of you, but I prefer getting them in front of your displays rather than in here. Well, I'm going to be down there. I'm part of the press oh, conference. Right. So, uh, yeah, so we can do maybe so just I'd do something down there. there. It's much more interesting. Okay, fine. There. Yeah. Okay. Works for me. Sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll, but yeah. you all, the two of you will be around so I can.